two archaeological evidences of Jesus Christ. Number one will be the Shroud of Turin. Enjoy. Shroud of Turin, an archaeological evidence that proves the Bible. The Shroud of Turin, also called the Holy Shroud, is a piece of linen cloth depicting a faint image. It has been revered for centuries as the authentic burial shroud that was used to wrap the body of Jesus of Nazareth after his crucifixion, and on which an image of Jesus' body was miraculously imprinted. In 1898, Second Paya produced the first photographs of the shroud, which showed that the human image on it can be seen more clearly in a black and white photographic negative than in its natural sepia color. This discovery is still relevant today as it helps in better understanding the shroud and its features. The shroud has a documented history dating back to 1354, when it was exhibited in a church in north-central France. Amazingly, this negative image possesses 3D details that go beyond the capabilities of paintings, botanical and DNA connections. In a pivotal moment of revelation in 2002, conservation efforts in Italy unveiled the hidden secret. The removal of the 16th century backing cloth exposed a rare type of stitch on the back of the shroud, a stitch known only from one other place, the Masada Fortress in Israel. This archaeological connection adds layers of authenticity to the shroud story, as Masada was a witness to the Jewish revolt, aligning with the historical timeline of Jesus. The Shroud's Narrative the presence of multiple wounds, consistent with Roman scourge, marks on the cloth match lead balls from a whip, and there's a wound on the chest with both blood and clear fluid, suggesting the heart stopped beating. The Shroud's journey is not just about what's on it, but where it's been. The Agony and Burial of Jesus Through the Shroud of Turin As we dive deep into the story depicted on the Shroud of Turin, we are transported to the harrowing moments leading to Jesus' crucifixion. Before the final act of sacrifice, Jesus endured a brutal and dehumanizing series of torments, each excruciating detail etched into the fabric of the shroud. Stripped and subjected to a merciless flogging, the flagrams used were tipped with both blunt and sharp objects, tearing into his flesh and reducing it to shreds. The agonizing process left the body battered and covered in wounds. To intensify his sufferings, Soldiers fashion a crown of thorns, not delicately woven, but hastily twisted from branches. After this merciless display of brutality, Jesus, now bearing the weight of his own cross, was dressed in his blood-stained garments and forced to carry the 150-pound burden. Despite the pain and loss of blood, he struggled forward, each step a grueling journey. The wooden cross dug into his shoulder, exacerbating the wounds from the flogging and inflicting additional torment as it banged against the thorny crown, sending sharp stabs of pain into his head. It is difficult for most of us to anticipate a major incident, let alone a scourge. Did Jesus know what would happen? Did he want this to happen? Did he warn his disciples? How did he handle the stress? Watch this video until the end to find the answers. For now, let us see what caused that much detail to show up on the Turin. Tripping and falling under the immense weight of the cross, Jesus endured yet another wave of suffering. The impact crushed his chest against the ground, twisting his arm and wrenching it severely out of its socket. The cross, now atop him, pressed into the back of his neck and shoulders, partially paralyzing him. His head sagged to the right, rendering his right side useless. In the state of agony, heartless soldiers callously pulled him up by his dislocated arm forcing him to continue the journey with the cross now on his left shoulder. Bent over in pain and weakness, his right arm hung helplessly by his side. The staggering steps forward were a testament to his resilience amidst unimaginable suffering. As we reflect on these vivid details imprinted on the Shroud of Turin, the narrative unfolds with stark realism. Each mark, each wound, tells a story of unparalleled sacrifice and suffering. The Shroud like a silent witness to these agonizing moments, invites us to contemplate the depth of Jesus' sacrifice and the profound love that compelled him to endure such brutality for the sake of humanity. In the end, the Shroud not only preserves the physical remnants of this crucible of pain, 
but also serves as a powerful testament to the resilience of faith and the enduring message of hope that emerged from the darkest hours of human history. Another question is who originally owned this cloth? Did Jesus pay for his burial, or was there someone else? Keep watching till the end and we will cover this. The Crucifixion and Burial on the Shroud of Turin As we approach the culmination of Jesus' journey, the Shroud of Turin vividly captures the heart-wrenching scene on Golgotha. His clothes, now soaked with blood, were mercilessly ripped from his body, reopening wounds that had started to adhere to the fabric. Helplessly thrown onto the cross, the soldiers proceeded to nail his already distorted and dislocated right arm, causing excruciating pain as nerves and ligaments were severed. When Jesus' body reached the tomb, it was placed in a bed of perfumed spices. The head cloth was removed, and the shroud was folded over him, loosely wrapped with a thin strip of linen. This gentle yet hurried burial was necessitated by the impending Sabbath. His lifeless form, wrapped in pure linen, was left in the tomb, the entrance sealed with a rolled stone. Description The shroud is a rectangular piece of cloth that measures approximately 4.4 by 1.1 meters, 14 feet 5 inches by 3 feet 7 inches, and is made of flax fibrils woven in a 3 to 1 herringbone twill pattern. The most distinctive feature of the cloth is the faint, brownish image of a man seen from the front and back. On the cloth, there is an image of a man with a beard, mustache, and shoulder-length hair parted in the middle. He appears muscular and tall, with various experts measuring him as between 1.70 to 1.88 meters, 5 feet 7 inches to 6 feet 2 inches. In 1532, a fire broke out in the chapel located in Chambry, France, causing damage to the shroud. The linen suffered burn holes and scorched patches on both sides due to contact with molten silver, which burned through it in some areas while it was folded. To repair the damage, nuns sewed 14 large triangular patches and 8 smaller ones onto the cloth. Conservation the shroud has undergone several restorations to preserve it and prevent further damage and contamination. It is stored in an airtight case made of laminated bulletproof glass. The case is temperature and humidity controlled to prevent chemical changes. The shroud itself is placed on an aluminum support that slides on runners and is stored flat within the case. According to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Joseph of Arimathea wrapped Jesus' body in a linen cloth and laid it in a newly built tomb. However, the Gospel of John suggests that strips of linen were used for the same purpose. Joseph of Arimathea was a biblical figure who played an important role in the burial of Jesus Christ. His account can be found in each of the four Gospels, Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 19. Mark chapter 15, verses 42 through 46. When evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent and respected member of the council, Sanhedrin, Jewish high court, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. And he courageously dared to go in before Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, only six hours after being crucified, and he summoned the centurion and asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that Jesus was in fact dead, he gave the body to Joseph by granting him permission to remove it. So Joseph purchased a fine linen cloth for wrapping the body, and after taking Jesus down from the cross, he wrapped him in the linen cloth and placed him in a tomb which had been cut out of rock. Then he rolled a large wheel-shaped stone against the entrance of the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea was named after his hometown in Judea to distinguish him from other Josephs mentioned in the Bible. Although there's not much biblical information about him, we can learn a few things from the text. Luke chapter 23 verse 50 states that Joseph was a member of the Jewish council of Sanhedrin, which called for Jesus' crucifixion. However, verse 51 reveals that Joseph opposed the council's decision and was secretly a follower of Jesus. 
Mark chapter 15 verse 43 also confirms this. Joseph was a wealthy man. Matthew chapter 27 verse 57. Although the source of his wealth is unknown. Additionally, the Bible portrays Joseph as a good and upright man. Luke chapter 23 verse 50. After Jesus was crucified, Joseph took a huge risk by approaching Roman Governor Pilate to request Jesus' body. Nicodemus, a Pharisee who had previously met with Jesus to inquire about God's kingdom, accompanied Joseph. Pilate granted them permission to take charge of Jesus' body, and they immediately began preparing it for burial. They followed the Jewish custom by wrapping the body in linen strips that were mixed with myrrh and aloe. However, it was the day of preparation which was the sixth day of the week, just before the Jewish Sabbath, and they were running out of time. So, Joseph and Nicodemus quickly placed Jesus in Joseph's own tomb, which was located in a garden close to the place of crucifixion. Joseph and Nicodemus were unaware that they were fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy by placing Jesus in Joseph's tomb. The prophecy stated that he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9. This is just one of many prophecies that serve to confirm Jesus' identity as the Messiah and Son of God. According to the Gospel of John, Simon Peter entered the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and found strips of linen along with the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still in its place, separate from the linen. However, in the Gospel of Luke, it is mentioned that Peter ran to the tomb and saw the strips of linen lying by themselves while bending over. Jesus' suffering did not just start at the cross. The way to Jerusalem. These events took place roughly a week before Jesus was crucified. He knew he was headed to the spot where he would die, placing himself on Calvary's altar as a sacrifice for sin. The disciples were nervous, and they had a sense of foreboding in the air. Although Jesus had previously stated that he would die, they were unprepared for this message. They didn't want to hear Jesus talk like that. They had visions of an earthly kingdom. On the road to Jerusalem, we encounter Jesus alone with his thoughts, and the disciples are taken aback. Then as the crowd grew larger, they became terrified. Jesus needed to say something encouraging. A sorrowful prediction. Mark chapter 10 verses 32 through 34. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were perplexed at what Jesus had said, and those who were following were alarmed and afraid. And again he took the twelve disciples aside and began telling them what was going to happen to him, saying, Listen very carefully. We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, Romans. They will mock and ridicule him and spit on him and whip, scourge him and kill him. And three days later he will rise from the dead. Jesus said he would be betrayed, sentenced, and executed. Matthew chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must of necessity suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and must be put to death, and after three days rise from death to life. He had warned them that this would happen. The word that jumps out in that statement is would. Jesus spoke about the necessity of his cross. Mark chapter 9 verse 31. Because he was teaching his disciples and preparing them for the future, he told them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed and handed over to men who are his enemies, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise from the dead three days later. Later. He mentioned his death again, but this time he used the term will. As he described what would happen to him, the emphasis was on the cruelty of the crucifixion. When Jesus made these prophecies, he was completely in control. Jesus handled his death in a way that we cannot. We understand that death is unavoidable, but we have no idea when, where, or how we will die. Jesus was fully aware of his death at Calvary. Instead of becoming a victim of circumstance or a martyr for a cause, Jesus was determined to pass. No one takes my life, but I lay it down of myself, he told the followers. John chapter 10, verse 18. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down voluntarily. 
I am authorized and have power to lay it down and to give it up, and I am authorized and have power to take it back. This command I have received from my Father. Mark chapter 10, verses 33 through 34, saying, Listen very carefully. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, Romans. They will mock and ridicule him and spit on him and whip, scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise from the dead. Jesus also predicted that he would be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes, the religious authorities of the day, and would condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They would insult, scourge, and spit on Jesus. He predicted that's exactly what they did. At the end, Jesus foreshadowed his own resurrection. For some reason, this passed right over the disciples' minds. They never seemed to hear that Jesus would rise from the dead. Resurrection continues to astound everyone, including many Christians. Despite all of this, Jesus rose from the grave three days later. Jesus is as alive today as he was when he arose from the tomb. A shameful ambition. Every time Jesus mentioned the cross, another spiritual defect in these disciples' life was revealed. But that's what the cross does. It reveals the human heart, showing us how self-centered we are. Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 36. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he replied to them, What do you want me to do for you? James and John approached Jesus and begged him to grant their desire. They put their mother up to it, according to Matthew. So Jesus inquired as to what they desired him to perform for them. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 21. Then Salome, the mother of Zebedee's children, James and John, came up to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down in respect, asked a favor of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She answered him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit in positions of honor and authority, one on your right and one on your left. Mark chapter 10, verse 37. They said to him, Grant that we may sit with you, one on your right and one on your left in your glory, your majesty and splendor in your kingdom. They stated that they desired specific places of honor in his glory. They were vying for the two most crucial posts in Jesus' kingdom's upper levels. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed here and now of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. All the transfiguration, Jesus had been speaking of his future glory and had shown them a glimpse of his kingdom. James and John heard a part of the message, which made them hesitant to accept the cross, but they were attracted to the idea of glory that it represented. Similarly, we tend to ignore the message of sacrifice and hardship, but when the word glory is mentioned, it catches our attention. Mark chapter 10, verse 38. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism of suffering and death with which I am baptized? They didn't understand what they were asking. So Jesus asked them, Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the same baptism that I am baptized with? Later Jesus asked his disciples, Shouldn't I drink the cup that my Father has given me? He also said, Father, if it's your will, please take this cup away from me, but I want your will to be done, not mine. John chapter 18, verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? That cup symbolized the agony Jesus would face at Calvary, and Jesus drank it all. When Jesus asked them about baptism, he was essentially asking if they were ready to fully immerse themselves in his mission. Mark chapter 10, verse 39. And they replied to him, We are able, Jesus told them. The cup that I drink, you will drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. That's how we are. Would you like to follow me? Jesus inquires. Yea, Lord, I can do it, we say. The problem concerning James and John is relevant to all of us. As Christians, we tend to focus more on the glory and rewards that come with our faith, rather than on serving and enduring the inevitable difficulties that come with it. 
However, the Bible teaches us that the path to glory always involves pain and sacrifice. Mark chapter 10, verses 40 through 41. But to sit on my right or left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Hearing this, the other ten became indignant with James and John. The other disciples were extremely dissatisfied when they heard about the discussion. That is because they desired these positions. Sacrificial Redemption Jesus was only a week away from being crucified, and his focus was on Jerusalem. However, his disciples were more concerned about who would sit in positions of power and glory. Jesus then gathered them and taught them about true greatness by contrasting his way with the ways of the world. First and foremost, Jesus willingly arrived to identify with us. Second, Jesus came to serve others, not to be served. He always helped those in need wherever he went. Third, Jesus' ultimate purpose was to offer his life as a ransom for many. The term ransom refers to paying a price in exchange for release. Jesus stated that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. This is a beautiful depiction of what Jesus did on the cross. He paid the price. The great stress that Jesus faced. Many people think that the road to the cross was easy for Jesus. If the decision were easy, the value of Jesus' sacrifice would be diminished. We read that Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Imagine this. You are about to endure one of the most excruciating deaths a person can experience. You will face humiliation and insults, and the people coming to arrest you will arrive soon. The book of Luke recounts the story of Jesus' final journey to his death, from his prayer in Gethsemane, where his faith in God is reaffirmed, to his burial. The Bible describes how an innocent man died for the sake of others. The Gospels each include a narrative that describes the time that Jesus, his disciples, and others spent in the Garden of Gethsemane just before Jesus was arrested. Jesus prayed to his Father in the Garden three times, saying, Matthew chapter 26, verse 39e, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. A little later, Jesus prays, Matthew chapter 26, verse 42. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My Father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink from it, your will be done. These prayers reveal Jesus' complete surrender to God's will before his crucifixion. According to the Bible, when Jesus spoke about the cup, he was referring to the suffering he was going to endure in the future. It was as if he was being presented with a cup full of bitterness, and he was expected to drink it all. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus talked about suffering. Matthew chapter 20, verse 22. But Jesus replied, You do not know what you are saying. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. When Jesus prayed to the Father, Let this cup pass from me. He was expressing the natural human desire to avoid pain and suffering. Although Jesus is fully God, he is also fully human. Despite being perfect, his human nature still struggled with accepting the torture and shame that awaited him, and his flesh recoiled from the cross. In the same context, Jesus told his disciples the following. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Keep watching and praying, so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When Jesus prayed, let this cup pass from me, he was fighting against the desires of his flesh, which yearned for self-preservation and comfort. The struggle was fierce, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved, so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and stay awake and keep watch with me. Matthew chapter 26, verse 38. This prayer, more than anything else, demonstrates that Jesus was in every way fully human. Jesus had foreknowledge of what was to come. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must of necessity suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. It must be put to death. And after three days, rise from death to life. The torment that he was going to go through was going to be more than just physical. It was also going to be mental and spiritual. 
Jesus was aware that it was God's plan for him to be crucified, that God wanted him to be pierced for our transgressions and wounded for our healing. Jesus knew that this was the will of God. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 through 7. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus loves mankind, but his humanity dreaded the pain and sorrow he faced, and it drove him to ask his Father, Let this cup pass from me. The phrase, let this cup pass from me, appears in Jesus' prayer, and it contains two significant qualifications. To begin, he utters the prayer, if it is possible. Jesus implores his Father to let him choose an alternative path to redemption for humankind if one exists. Jesus did not want to die, but he followed the will of God. The events that occurred after he prayed demonstrate that there was no other way. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the only one that could possibly redeem the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Second, Jesus prays, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was committed to the will of God, body, mind, and soul. The prayer of the righteous is always dependent on the will of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus conquered the flesh and kept it in subjection to the Spirit. He accomplished this by submitting himself wholeheartedly and fervently to the will of God. When we go through difficult times, it is comforting to know that Jesus understands what it's like to want God's will and yet not to want it, to desire righteousness and obedience, even when the flesh is screaming out against it. This conflict is not sinful. It is a normal part of being human. Our Redeemer fully embodied human nature in every aspect. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brothers so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He successfully completed his mission by seeking and saving the lost, despite suffering until the end. His prayerful openness reveals a profound relationship with God. It was a difficult time, but the disciples failed to grasp the gravity of the situation and fell asleep. Luke chapter 22, verses 43 through 45. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood, falling down upon the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. An angel appeared to comfort Jesus, which is significant as it shows that heaven stands by him as he faces his calling, even in difficult times. As he faced rejection and death, Jesus prayed to God and laid his burdens before him. This humanizes Jesus and shows that he experienced a range of emotions in the face of his death. Luke's portrayal of Jesus does not hide his divinity, but instead shows him as someone who can understand and empathize with our flaws and traumas. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. This text reveals something about Jesus' character while demonstrating how we can face the great trials of life that God sends us. These verses show a man who is reliant on God and determined to do His will. We see a person who faces adversity by turning to God and another who expresses his intense emotions to God in prayer. Jesus is not spared the trial, but what is supplied is the strength to face it. Though he does not hesitate to ask if another way can be found, he affirms his determination to follow God's will. Heaven responds by giving Jesus the strength to face what God has called him to do, not by granting his request for another way. 
passage revolves around this union of submission to the divine call and divine strength supplied. This passage highlights the admirable traits of Jesus as he confronts the trial of the cross. During prayer, Jesus openly expresses his anguish and dependence on God. His regular practice of communing with God remains unchanged, even amidst the unprecedented circumstances he faces. In contrast, we often tend to overlook seeking God's help when we are occupied with our daily activities. Trials often bring us to our knees, but the fast-paced life can prevent us from praying. However, this is not the case with Jesus. His example reminds us that prayer is essential, even in the midst of chaos. Jesus' prayer is not just a quick check-in. It is full of honesty, emotion, and pain. True prayer requires effort. Unfortunately, instead of putting in the effort, we often simply bow our heads, close our eyes, and let our minds wander. During prayer, Jesus demonstrates his honesty and humility. He sincerely expresses his hope that God will not force him to go through what is ahead of him, but he is even more committed to doing God's will. Though different from the laments and psalms, the prayer is similar in that it allows the petitioner to express their deepest emotions and pain to God. The private confrontation that occurs in prayer frequently produces the solace we require to take the next step while holding God's hand. Moreover, prayer is not a haphazard activity. As Jesus seeks God in the midst of his situation, he prays with his entire being, even sweating blood drops. Jesus can walk with God because he seeks him on a regular basis. It is interesting that Luke, a physician, would bring up this unusual medical condition. Hematidrosis is a rare condition. The current understanding is that when someone is stressed, the small blood vessels within sweat glands rupture, allowing blood to mix with sweat. According to Dr. Frederick Zugabi, this happens because around the sweat glands, there are multiple blood vessels in a net-like form. When a person is under great stress, the vessels constrict, and as the anxiety fades away, the blood vessels dilate to the point of rupture. The blood goes into the sweat glands, and as the sweat glands are producing a lot of sweat, it pushes the blood to the surface, coming out as droplets of blood mixed with sweat. This explanation sheds light on Jesus' situation in the garden. However, there is a challenging word in the Greek text that requires careful consideration. It says that his sweat became hose, great drops of blood. Jesus in Gethsemane and his agony is the main point of the narrative. When Jesus arrives in the garden, he tells his disciples that he is deeply troubled and distressed. He is overcome with grief to the point of death. Luke captures this by referring to sweat as if it were drops of blood. Why is he overcome right now? The pain that Jesus endured was not simple, but rather complex. It becomes clear that he had to bear the penalty that sin deserved for millions upon millions of people. In the garden, Jesus' humanity is fully revealed and his agony is made known. In this moment, we see Jesus at his most vulnerable. Despite being sinless, he is experiencing the truest essence of what it means to be human. He is feeling our grief and facing stronger temptations than any of us ever have. It's fair to say that he was tempted in every possible way. As Christ gazes into the cup, he prays, If it is possible, take this cup from me. He appeals again, but there is silence. He appeals a second time, but there is still silence. He appeals a third time, and again there is silence. Through his silence, we come to understand that this was God's will. Every leader feels alone at times, especially when venturing into new territory. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus experienced one of his most lonely moments. Every member of his team deserted him just hours before he was to be tried, tortured, and crucified. His story in the Garden is one of history's most potent examples of a leader's dedication. Every leader who does something significant for God has a Gethsemane experience. What can we learn from this lonely time? Gethsemane is the location where, number one, spiritual battles occur. Number two, loneliness is felt. Number three, honesty is expressed. Number four, submission is required. Number five, strength is received. We need to comprehend the solitude and the grief of Gethsemane because it helps us to understand the accomplishment of Gethsemane. Some have been a relation between bloody sweat on the brow of Jesus with the curse of Adam, who would toil by the sweat of his brow. Adam failed the garden test. Have you ever doubted God's love for you? 
take a look at the Garden of Gethsemane. You can witness the Son of God sweating profusely, like drops of blood, showing His determination to not only obey the Father, but also to redeem humanity. He drank from the cup in your honor. And if you look at the Father's silence, you can see that there was no other way to redeem humanity, or else His wrath would be poured out on His Son. Let the logic of Romans chapter 8, verse 32 motivate you. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also, along with Him, graciously give us all things? If God had not been committed to your redemption, He would have let humanity be swallowed up by His wrath while preserving His Son. But He did not. He did it not only because He loves us, but also because that is who God is. It is in His nature to be self-giving, to give of Himself so that others may live. You can have faith in this. Who can be against you if God is on your side? If you attended Sunday school, you've probably heard this question dozens of times. Where did Jesus die? Ask some people, and they'll say, the place of the skull. Others say Calvary or Golgotha. All three titles refer to the location of Jesus' death on the cross on Good Friday. Over two millennia ago, this location has far more historical significance in the Bible and was not chosen randomly. Golgotha, also known as Calvary, is a skull-shaped hill in ancient Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. It appears in all four Gospels. Golgotha is the Aramaic name of the location where Jesus was crucified outside of Old Jerusalem. In John chapter 19, verses 16 through 18, we read, Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Place of the Skull which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. In Luke chapter 23, verse 33 of the King James Version, the word Calvary is used about the same location. In modern translations, the more literal term, the place that is called the skull, is generally used. Calvary comes from the Latin phrase for this location, Calvaria locus. John chapter 19, verses 15 through 17. So they shouted, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, carrying his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. It was some well-known spot outside the gate, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Therefore Jesus also suffered outside the gate, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. And when they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, as he was coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. The location was also near the city, and contained a garden. John chapter 19, verse 41. Now there was a garden at the place where he was crucified, and in the garden a new tomb, cut out of solid rock, in which no one had yet been laid. Luke refers to the location of the crucifixion as the place called the skull. Luke chapter 23, verse 33, which can also be translated literally as the place called the cranian, which is the generic Greek term for skull. Both Aramaic and Greek were common spoken languages in Israel during Luke's period, so he can recount what Matthew wrote in Aramaic. There is a good chance that this location had also gained some notoriety. If locals from nearby Jerusalem had given it a nickname, then it would have had fame, or in this case, it would have had infamy. In spite of the fact that we do not know the precise location, Archaeologists have a pretty good idea of its general vicinity, which they refer to as outside the gates of Jerusalem. According to Grace Communion International, they've narrowed it down to two contenders. But in recent times, only two have been deemed worthy of serious concern. The traditional site lies within the area now occupied by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the Christian quarter of the Old City. The other contending location is a rocky hill commonly called Gordon's Calvary, just north of Jerusalem's old city. We shouldn't be alarmed that we don't have an exact location for Jesus' death or even burial. Christianity focuses on the resurrection of Jesus rather than his death. After all, the angel declares, at Jesus' burial site, he is not here, he is risen. 
And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine mixed with bile to drink. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. Jesus had been very weak from the scourge. When the soldiers leave Pilate's palace to crucify Jesus outside the city walls, they realize that Jesus is so weak from being flogged that he will not be able to carry the cross. This realization leads to the soldiers' decision to crucify Jesus outside the city walls. Pilgrim Simon from Cyrene in North Africa is recruited by Roman soldiers to carry the cross piece of Jesus to Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified. Simon's hometown is in North Africa. Matthew chapter 27, verses 35 through 36. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Jesus is crucified, nailed to a cross, put through a humiliating and excruciating death. The crucifixion victims typically passed away after suffering for two or three agonizing days from thirst, exhaustion, and exposure to the elements. The soldiers divide up Jesus' clothes and then settle in to guard the execution. They make it a point to ensure that none of Jesus' many followers try to save him from being executed. Psalm 22 is undeniably fulfilled by the components of the scene. Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my help are the words of my groaning. Matthew chapter 27, verses 37 through 44. And above his head they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two rebels were being crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were speaking abusively to him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He could not save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He has trusted in God. Let God rescue him now. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the son of God. And the rebels who had been crucified with him were also insulting him in the same way. Psalm chapter 22, verse 7. All who see me laugh at me and mock me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, at Golgotha, the highest levels of leadership also came to insult Jesus for the last time. Even the rebels who were being crucified alongside him made fun of him for his failed messianic claim. However, Golgotha, also known as Calvary, remains a powerful reminder of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, which was the only sacrifice capable of forgiving sins and reconciling humankind with God. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is a possibility that we do not know the precise location where Jesus was crucified, but we have two very good hypotheses. Thankfully, Jesus does not stay in Golgotha, nor in the vicinity. Even though they bury him nearby on Easter Sunday, he conquers death and leaves the tomb. After the 40 days he ascends into heaven, even though Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, he does not end the story there. He offers us hope beyond the cross of Golgotha, that not only did he rise from the dead and win the victory over death, but also that we will one day experience a resurrection of our own. He was one of three people sentenced to death that day and hung between two thieves. One of these two men recognized Jesus and requested that the Lord remember him in the kingdom. Jesus responded, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Because of this, Jesus went to the cross to shed his blood to forgive and redeem the sinners who put their faith in him. This hill, which we call Golgotha, or Calvary, continues to stand as a reminder of Jesus' great sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice was the only sacrifice that could forgive sin and reconcile man with God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. A poem from Roy Allen Reed's It Is Finished. It Is Finished was written to celebrate the victory Jesus Christ won on that first Good Friday, resounding throughout the universe, transcending time and space. It is the greatest shout of victory heard by the human race. 
from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ came that tremendous cry, It is finished, was his shout, as he laid down his life to die. All scripture has been fulfilled, and the prophecies now complete, as the one of whom all prophets speak held Satan in defeat. The battle has been won by him, the immortal God who died. His precious blood has flowed for sin, and the law is satisfied. How vast the ransom he has paid, for no work was left undone. The gate to heaven opened wide by God's one and only Son. Humankind has been redeemed, and the full price for sin is paid. The shame and suffering are over. Atonement has been made. My Lord and my love is crucified, the sinner's faithful friend. The Alpha and Omega is the beginning and the end. His perfect life sacrificed to pay the dreadful price of sins. The age of law ends at the cross as the age of grace begins. The great battle is over, and man's redemption has been won. No more need for types and shadows, for the will of God is done. Satan has been defeated by Jesus Christ the crucified. The sting of death is vanquished as the grave bursts open wide. And that wraps up our journey into the secrets of the Shroud of Turin. It's like a puzzle with science, history, and faith all mixed together. The special patterns on the cloth, the image of the guy on it, and the wounds that came before the picture, they make us wonder. The Shroud tells stories from long ago, like a traveler leaving hints in the dirt from Jerusalem to faraway places. The blood on it stays a bright red. The body's shape is just right, making it all more interesting. Even the tiny flowers on it tells tales of where it might have been. So, as we say goodbye to the Shroud of Turin, let's keep these questions in our heads. It's like an exciting mystery that makes us want to explore more, whether it's a real thing or a reflection. Number 2. The Pilate Stone The Pilate Stone Archaeological discovery proved the truth of the Bible. The Pontius Pilate Stone In June 1961, an Italian archaeologist named Dr. Antonio Frova led a campaign during which Maria Teresa discovered a limestone block. This block alone seemed to corroborate the truth of the Bible. So what is this pilot stone? The pilot stone is a damaged block of limestone measuring 82 centimeters by 65 centimeters. It bears a partially preserved inscription that is believed to have been written by Pontius Pilate the prefect of the Roman province of Judea, from A.D. 26 to 36. This artifact was discovered at the Caesarea Maritima archaeological site in 1961, and it has been of significant importance ever since. The reason for its significance is that it bears an authentic first-century Roman inscription that mentions the name Pontius Pilatus. Artifacts can provide a bigger picture of a particular culture and also offer detailed insights into the lives of individuals. Recently, a stone fragment was found near an ancient theater constructed by Herod the Great around 22 to 10 BC in the city of Caesarea. The fragment turned out to be a piece of the dedicatory inscription of a later building, possibly a temple. This inscription dates back to the time of Pilate, and it aligns with the historical accounts of his career. In fact, this inscription is the earliest surviving and only contemporary record of Pilate, who is mostly known from the New Testament. Its discovery is a significant contribution to our understanding of Pilate's life and times. It is likely that Pontius Pilate was based in Caesarea Maritima where the stone was discovered, as the city had replaced Jerusalem as the administrative capital and military headquarters of the province in AD 6. Three of the original four lines of text are still readable. The translation from Latin to English for the inscription reads, To the divine Auguste, this Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea has dedicated this. Interestingly, the Pilate Stone, as it has come to be known, 
provides confirmation that Pontius Pilate held the position of prefect in Judea. Philo, the Jewish philosopher, has given us the earliest surviving written account of Pontius Pilate. According to Philo, Pilate was a man with an inflexible and merciless disposition. He served as one of the emperor's lieutenants and had a tendency to become exceedingly angry. Pilate was ferocious, had a habit of insulting people and unjustly executing them without trial or condemnation. The Roman historian Tacitus records that Christus suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. Despite the doubts of skeptics, the Bible is a historically accurate document. Its descriptions of names, places, dates, empires, and events have been proven true time and again. In the past, archaeology was thought to disprove the Bible, but now many archaeologists agree that it is an accurate historical record. Christianity centers around the actions of Jesus on the cross. If there was no actual Jesus, cross, empty tomb, or Pontius Pilate in history, then the fundamental truth of Christianity would be called into question. But it isn't a lie. Pilate is a complex and fascinating character in the New Testament. But who is this Pontius Pilate? Jesus meets Pontius Pilate. Jesus had been arrested and was led away from Caiaphas and to the governor's headquarters. The Jewish officials refused to enter the Gentile arena because it would make them unclean and prevent them from eating the Passover. They had rejected God's Messiah and were attempting to execute an innocent man, but they were concerned about being ceremonially unclean. They couldn't see that their evil deeds had already made them filthy. When Pilate insisted that they judge Jesus according to their own law, they made their intentions clear. It is not legal for us to put anyone to death. According to secular history, Pilate is depicted as a harsh and merciless individual who lacked empathy towards the morals of others. Pilate's marriage to Caesar Augustus' granddaughter played a significant role in his appointment as the procurator of Judea, which he wouldn't have achieved otherwise. John chapter 18, verse 31. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. Clearly, Jesus was not a victim of fate. He is the sovereign Lord who planned his death. Apparently, the Jews had informed Pilate that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah and a king in opposition to Caesar. Because when Jesus stood before him, he asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Following his Roman character, Pilate went straight to the point and demanded to know the accusation. He was a weak man who tried to cover up his weakness by a show of obstinacy and violence. His period of office was marked by several savage outbreaks of bloodshed. We read, What accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate, consistent with the Roman character, asked directly about the accusation. John noted their evasion of the question. If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. They didn't want Pilate to be the judge, but rather the implementer of the sentence which they had already passed illegally. We read, You take him and judge him according to your law. When Pilate realized that the people were trying to avoid giving a clear accusation against Jesus, he instructed them to handle the matter themselves. He made it clear that if they could not present any legitimate accusations against Jesus, he would not judge him. Instead, they would have to follow their own law 
and not involve the Romans. Although John does not record it, the religious leaders eventually provided Pilate with a more specific accusation in response to his demand. Luke chapter 23, verse 2. And they began to bring charges against him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. The religious leaders did not want to judge Jesus according to their own law. They wanted him dead. But the Romans did not allow them to execute anyone under their own law. In the past, there were instances where religious leaders took the risk of executing those they believed were guilty without seeking permission from the Roman authorities. One such execution by stoning is recorded in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60. In such cases, these leaders would generally choose stoning as the method of execution. It is believed that the religious leaders may have pressed for the crucifixion of Jesus to fulfill the curse mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 through 23. Now, if a person has committed a sin carrying a sentence of death and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body is not to be left overnight on the tree, but you shall certainly bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is cursed of God, so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. He did bear that curse to redeem us from the curse of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The demand of the Jews that Jesus should be put to death by the Roman method of crucifixion was in fulfillment of Jesus' own words. If I be lifted up, John chapter 3, verse 14. If the Jews had executed Jesus by stoning, the prophecy regarding the manner of his death would not have been fulfilled. John chapter 18, verses 33 through 35. Therefore Pilate entered the Praetorium again, and summoned Jesus and said to him, You are the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Pilate intended to transfer this problem to Herod, since Jesus was from Galilee, which was under Herod's rule. However, Herod returned Jesus to Pilate, which is likely the start of the second appearance. We read, Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate had sent a detachment of Roman troops to arrest Jesus. John chapter 18, verse 3. So Judas, having obtained the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. This was Pilate's first encounter with a man the religious leaders claimed was dangerous. However, Pilate's inquiry betrayed uncertainty. Pilate had witnessed several unruly revolutionaries who professed to be kings. Pilate had expected to meet a sullen or belligerent rebel, but was instead met with the calm majesty of confident superiority. He could not reconcile the character of the prisoner with the charge brought against him. We read, Are you speaking for yourself? Jesus was curious to know whether Pilate was genuinely seeking the truth, or if he was merely asking on behalf of those who had already condemned Jesus. Depending on the source of Pilate's question, the answer could differ. If Pilate asked the question himself, he was likely wondering if Jesus was a political king who plotted against Caesar. If, on the other hand, he was prompted by Caiaphas, 
he was probably asking if Jesus was the Messianic King of Israel. In the first case, the answer would have been no, whereas in the second case, the answer would have been yes. We read, What have you done? Pilate, being a Roman, had no interest in Jewish spiritual or social ideas. However, he understood that if the religious leaders demanded the death of Jesus, he must have committed some wrongdoing. Pilate wanted to investigate the matter and find out what it was. Jesus could have provided an amazing response to the inquiry, what have you done? He was sinless and never did anything wrong against God or man. He performed miraculous healings, gave sight to the blind, calmed storms, walked on water, fed multitudes, defeated demons, and even raised the dead. His teachings were so clear and powerful that they astonished his listeners. He fearlessly confronted corruption and poured his life into a few men who were destined by God to change the world. He did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It would have been wiser for Pilate to base his judgment on the prisoner's actions instead of asking what he had done. Jesus explains his kingdom to Pilate. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. We read, My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus explicitly told Pilate that he was a king and had the authority to speak about his kingdom. However, he also made it clear that his kingdom was not a political kingdom and did not pose any threat to the existing political order. In contrast to the earthly kingdoms, the kingdom of Jesus has its origins in heaven and is not limited by human limitations. Jesus himself affirmed that his kingdom is not of this world. Furthermore, unlike the kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of Jesus is founded on the principle of peace. Jesus explained that if his kingdom were of this world, his followers would have fought to defend it. But this was not the case, as the kingdom of Jesus is not based on violence or coercion. There is no denying that his kingdom rules over this world. However, it will not be established by the power of this world. We read, My kingdom is not from here. It is possible to imagine that Pilate was relieved and satisfied to learn that the kingdom of Jesus was not from this world. Pilate may have concluded that Rome had nothing to fear from Jesus and his kingdom. Romans believed that they were knowledgeable about kingdoms and their power. They thought that armies, navies, swords and battles measured the strength of kingdoms. However, Jesus knew that his kingdom although not of this world, was more powerful than Rome and would continue to grow in influence even after Rome had faded away. The kingdom of heaven is founded on love, sacrifice, humility, and righteousness, as demonstrated by Jesus on the cross. Jesus and Pilate discuss truth. John chapter 18 verses 37 through 38. Therefore Pilate said to him, So, you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after saying this, he came out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no grounds at all for charges in his case. We read, 
Are you a king then? Pilate was particularly interested in a specific statement. He didn't have any problem with religious leaders among the Jews, even if they were considered insane, as long as they didn't cause any trouble and didn't pose a threat to the Roman rule. However, if someone claimed to be a rival king, this could potentially lead to a challenge, and Pilate wanted to investigate this matter. We read, You say rightly that I am a king. Jesus did not deny that he was a king. He insisted that he was born a king, but of a different kind. He came to be a king of truth, so that he could bear witness to the truth. He appealed to Pilate not for acquittal or mercy, but for recognition of the truth. He believed that it was only through truth that he could influence the minds and govern the manners of his subjects. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world. Many years later, Paul encouraged Timothy with these words. Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. Jesus' confession was that he was a king, and his kingdom came from heaven. It was a kingdom of eternal truth, in contrast to earthly power. We read, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world. The Lord suggests that he was born as a king with a specific purpose, which is a compelling evidence of the incarnation of the Son of God. We read, I find no fault in him at all. Pilate had a conversation with the religious leaders who wished to put Jesus to death, and he made it clear that Jesus was not guilty. Pilate went beyond stating that Jesus was not guilty of a crime that deserved the death penalty. He found no fault in him at all. Pilate was aware of Jesus' innocence. John chapter 18, verses 39 through 40. However, you have a custom that I release one prisoner for you at the Passover. Therefore, do you wish that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they shouted again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. Judging that there was something different and innocent about Jesus, Pilate hoped that this custom of releasing a prisoner might help deliver this man whom Pilate knew was innocent. We read, Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked the question to appeal to the crowd, hoping they would spare the man they had named as their own king from being crucified. Pilate hopes to satisfy the mob by having Jesus whipped and mocked. John chapter 19 verses 1 through 4. So Pilate then took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and put her purple cloak on him. And they repeatedly came up to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And slapped him in the face again and again. And then Pilate came out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you will know that I find no grounds at all for charges in his case. In the past, Pilate stated that he found no fault in Jesus. However, he still ordered a severe and brutal punishment for a man whom he knew was innocent. Some people suggest that Pilate wanted to help Jesus by hoping that the mob would be satisfied with the scourging. Since Pilate gave the order, Jesus was scourged according to the Roman practice. The whip used for scourging had many leather strands each with sharp pieces of bone or metal at its end. It caused the back to become raw flesh, and it was not uncommon for a criminal to die from this punishment, even before the crucifixion. Scourging was a punishment method with three purposes. It was used to punish prisoners, 
to obtain confessions of crimes from prisoners and to weaken the victim in cases of crucifixion so that they would die more quickly on the cross. Pilate ordered the scourging of his prisoner in the hope that it would satisfy the crowd, not as part of the capital punishment or to elicit the truth. However, his decision was ill-judged. It is remarkable that the Gospels only use one word to describe this horrific event without attempting to manipulate our emotions. The Gospel of Matthew states that Jesus was stripped of his clothes and given a reed to mock a royal scepter. The soldiers bowed before him, offering false homage and honor, while also spitting on him. However, we have the option to do the opposite of what these soldiers did to Jesus. Instead of mocking and dishonoring him, we can honor and praise him. Let us be creative in devising ways to honor our king and offer him true homage, unlike the soldiers who only pretended to do so. We read, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate, as a judge, had both responsibility and reason to set Jesus free, declaring him innocent of any wrongdoing. He made five attempts to release Jesus, as we can learn from Luke chapter 23, verses 4, 15, 20, 22, and John chapter 19, verses 4, 12, and 13. However, instead of setting him free, Jesus had to endure humiliation and brutality. Pilate presents Jesus to the crowd. John chapter 19 verses 5 through 6. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man! So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they shouted, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no grounds for charges in his case. Pilate invited the crowd to carefully consider the suffering of this one that was presented before them. In a way, Pilate was speaking on behalf of God who invites all his humanity to behold the man, the perfect man, the tested and approved ideal of all humanity. This is an invitation to see the man of men in all his glory. Pilate believed that he could rescue Jesus by debasing him. Similarly, some individuals in modern times also try to do this by asserting that Jesus is not divine or that he was incorrect about certain things, in an effort to keep Jesus relevant in a progressive scientific era. However, such attempts are just as misguided as Pilate's actions. It is unclear how the crowd reacted to the situation, but it is possible that they may have felt a moment of sympathy for the strong and remarkable man involved. However, the religious leaders present immediately reacted with pure hatred towards him, screaming, Crucify him! Crucify him! The crowd might have felt sorry for the prisoner, but the priests and their followers silenced any sympathy by shouting their hatred. John chapter 19, verses 7 through 11. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. 
According to John's account, the religious leader's real accusation against Jesus was not that he claimed to be king, but that he claimed to be God, the one and only Son of God. They understood this claim in a very particular way, believing that when Jesus called himself the Son of God, he was actually claiming to be equal to the Supreme Being. We read, he was the more afraid. Pilate did not react with anger or amusement when he was told that Jesus had proclaimed himself as the Son of God. Instead, he was filled with more fear than ever before. Pilate saw something in Jesus, even in his beaten, bloodied, and spat upon state, that made him consider the possibility that Jesus was more than just an ordinary man. The phrase more afraid may actually have a superlative force, as is often seen in New Testament Greek, and could be translated as exceedingly afraid. Pilate was not a particularly religious man, but the news of Jesus' divine claims terrified him. During that time, all Romans were familiar with stories of gods or their offspring appearing in human form. We read, where are you from? Pilate wanted Jesus to defend himself and provide more reasons to be released as an innocent man. He was searching for a good enough reason to let him go. Pilate hoped that Jesus would explain what distinguished him from the many other prisoners that Pilate had judged before. However, Jesus had already informed Pilate that he was the king of a kingdom that was not of this world and had already disclosed where he was from. Therefore, Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Although he already had the answer, one could argue that Pilate asked the right question. His question is almost the most pertinent question that can be asked about him. For to know where Jesus comes from is to know the most important thing about him. John chapter 19 verses 10 through 11. So Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Pilate was astonished that Jesus refused to speak in his own defense. He couldn't believe that Jesus didn't plead for mercy, as many others had done before him. Pilate was also surprised that Jesus didn't seem intimidated by the power and authority that Pilate held as a representative of Rome, who was judging him. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 was fulfilled when Jesus remained silent before his accusers and judges, like a sheep before its shearers. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. Do you not know that I have power? Pilate was surprised that Jesus wasn't intimidated by his power to condemn and crucify as he believed he held the power position. Pilate believed that he had the power to make decisions, but in reality, he only had the ability to cause harm and do wrong. He lacked the power to do what was right. Although it was evident that Jesus was innocent, Pilate bowed down to the pressure of the religious leaders and the crowd that they had influenced. By claiming that he had the power to do what the crowd wanted, he actually had no power at all. The right thing to do would have been to release the innocent man, but Pilate's weakness caused him to make the wrong decision. The man who claimed to have all power attempted to absolve himself of the decision, stating, I didn't really want to do this. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. Now when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, 
but rather that a riot was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. You yourselves shall see. We read, You could have no power at all against me unless it have been given you from above. Jesus explained the true nature of power to Pilate, who believed Rome possessed the power. However, Jesus knew that God held the true power, he acknowledged Pilate's power, but clarified that it was granted by God and not inherent in Pilate or Rome. When Jesus said, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin, he was not claiming that Pilate was without sin. Rather, he was saying that the religious leaders were guilty of a greater sin than Pilate's in delivering him to the Roman authorities. The phrase, he that delivered me can refer to either Judas or Caiaphas, as the language used by the evangelist is intentionally vague. John chapter 19 verses 12 through 13. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him, but the Jews shouted, saying, If you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. We read, Pilate sought to release him. We detected a sense of panic in the Roman governor. The panic intensified when his wife urged him to free the accused due to a dream she had. Matthew chapter 27 verses 19 through 20. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, See that you have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. It is difficult to know for sure what she saw in her dream. It could have been a vision of Jesus, an innocent man being crowned with thorns and crucified. Alternatively, she may have seen him descending from the clouds in glory. It is also possible that she saw him presiding over the great white throne of judgment, with her and her husband standing before him. He knew this innocent man, a man not like any other prisoner he had seen before, should be set free. Yet he felt the full force of the crowd and religious leaders demanding his crucifixion. If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. From a human perspective, it was the mention of Caesar that ultimately led to Jesus' faith. The phrase, a friend of Caesar, had a more significant meaning than just a reference to Roman patriotism. It was commonly used to refer to someone who was a supporter or associate of the emperor and held an important position within the inner circle. Although he desired to be a friend of Caesar, he was not really his friend and barely knew him. Pilate presented Jesus before the crowd and judgment seat. However, in truth, it was Pilate who was being judged, not Jesus. Matthew chapter 27 verses 14 through 16. And still he did not answer him in regard to even a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. However, Pilate did not pass the test. Driven by his fear of the crowd, he made the decision to send an innocent man to a painful death. This is why the ancient creed states that Jesus was crucified during the reign of Pontius Pilate. The Crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth Matthew chapter 27 verses 17 through 18 As per the Roman tradition, Jesus carried his own cross from the place of his sentencing to the place of a skull, where he was to be crucified. In those times, the Romans would put the cross on the condemned man 
and force him to carry it in a public procession to draw attention to his crime and fate. Crucifixion was first invented by the Persians, but the Romans perfected it and made it a common practice. It was a punishment reserved for the worst criminals and the lowest classes. The purpose of crucifixion was to inflict slow, painful, and humiliating death upon the victim in public. This was the exact form of death that God intended for Jesus to die, and Jesus submitted to it in accordance with God's will. Archaeologists found in 1968 the remains of a man crucified in Jesus' era. The study of the remains indicated that the victim was nailed to the cross in a sitting position. Both legs were sideways, with the nail penetrating the sides of both feet just below the heel. The arms were stretched out, with a nail in each forearm. Dr. Nico Haas, a professor of anatomy at Hebrew University, described it as a compulsive position, a difficult and unnatural posture designed to increase the sufferer's agony. And two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. There were three planned for crucifixion on that particular day, the two others and Barabbas. Jesus bore the place of Barabbas. According to Roman custom, the individual who was to be crucified had their crime written out and a title hung around their neck as they carried their cross to the place of death. The title was later placed at the top of the cross so that everyone would know the reason for the crucifixion. In his death, Jesus remained connected to his humble roots in Nazareth. He was acknowledged as a king, even in death. Earthly kings often claim their throne by causing the deaths of others. But Jesus, through his own death, was declared king to the entire world. Pilate wanted this statement regarding Jesus to be as public as possible. This is also an unknowing prophecy of how the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified and reigning as king would be published to every nation and language that it was from the beginning intended as a global message. The religious leaders objected to Pilate's title as they believed it was false. They did not believe that Jesus was the King of the Jews. Moreover, the leaders thought that the title was demeaning because it showcased Rome's power to humiliate and torture even the King of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. Pilate finally found the courage to defy the Jewish rulers, but it was for a matter that wasn't very significant. Pilate acknowledged the true nature of the King of Truth, both in his humility and in his glory. I won't change what I have written, Pilate said. According to Roman law, once a sentence is pronounced, it cannot be altered. And since this inscription was considered to be the sentence against our Lord, it cannot be changed. Joseph of Arimathea sets Jesus in his own tomb. Matthew chapter 27 verses 57 through 61. Now when it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea came, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary, sitting opposite the tomb. Customarily, the bodies of crucified criminals were left on their crosses to rot or to be eaten by wild animals. But the Jews wanted no such horror displayed during the Passover season, and Romans were known to grant the corpses of executed men to friends or relatives for proper burial. 
Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 66. Now on the next day, that is, the day which is after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember that when that deceiver was still alive, he said, After three days I am rising. Therefore give orders for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal him and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the tomb secure with the guard, sealing the stone. They gave Pilate a title of honor and respect. But the day before, these same religious leaders rejected the king of kings. They mocked and despised him, putting Jesus to open shame, but they honored Pilate. It must mean that the chief priests and Pharisees actually approached Pilate on the Sabbath with their request. If they did that, it is clear to see how radically they broke the Sabbath law. Ironically, the enemies of Jesus remembered his promise of resurrection better than his own disciples remembered. In this, the enemies of Jesus admit that Jesus is dead. They did not believe the swoon theory, a conjecture that denies the resurrection, saying that Jesus never really died, but just swooned on the cross, and then somehow wonderfully revived in the tomb. You have a guard, was Pilate's promise to supply a Roman guard. According to archaeological evidence and ancient texts, Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea, who was responsible for sentencing Jesus of Nazareth to be crucified, was a cruel leader. His main objective was to advance the interests of Rome in the Judean province. Pilate was also self-serving and understood the importance of maintaining the support of Emperor Tiberius. However, Pilate's cruelty and his habit of executing men without a proper trial led to his recall to Rome in 37 AD, where he was tried and punished. Eusebius, a historian, reports that Pilate eventually fell into misfortune and became his own executioner. However, this is not the only item that has been found that changed everything. To watch another discovery that proved the truth of the Bible, click here.